Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with a special guest who does a lot of stuff. Massimo, I think I know you probably better than just the average conversation that I usually do with people. Usually I try not to do too much research, but I went onto your website and then there's the, you know, astrophysicist angle, but also you are interested in so many topics where I'm like, where would you like to start? Like if you were going to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening besides astrophysicists, and you can explain that as well too. But what topic is on your mind, man? Because you're like me, you're all over the place. Yeah, thank you. Well, my topic uh, in my mind is something in which I am involved right now, namely the um, uh, possibility to uh, take, to obtain uh, scientific data uh, regarding so-called UFOs that we now call UAPs, uh, scientific data using the same methodology that we use when we take uh, data about uh, astronomical objects. So the only, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm a physical scientist. Yes, I have many interests, but uh, at the present time, um, um, I, I'm very compelled in uh, strategies and techniques to try to obtain good data. Um, you, uh, possibly good data using uh, simultaneously uh, several kinds of instruments, so optical instruments, uh, um, electromagnetic uh, instruments, magnetometers, uh, uh, and also uh, sound instruments uh, to measure sound, but also infrasound and, and ultrasound to measure all these things simultaneously uh, of uh, strange objects that uh, people see in the sky. So first of all, we have to verify if an anomaly really exists because um, uh, uh, we have to compare what in case we are able to see uh, with uh, what we already know. So um, for instance, I, I being a, a an affiliate researcher of the Galileo project. Um, I collaborate with them in my specific field uh, to try to obtain this kind of data. And uh, the engineers of the group uh, who are working very well are using artificial intelligence, a software which is based on artificial intelligence, which is able to recognize uh, prosaic objects like airplanes, fighter airplanes, drones, birds, and whatever that is normal from something that we don't know. When we see there is an anomaly, then all the instruments will uh, track these objects and try to take data uh, during the time of observation in order to see if uh, um, if this, uh, these things in the sky are behaving in a crazy way, such as uh, strange kinematic behavior, strange accelerations, luminosity changes, and, uh, and so forth. So at this moment, I'm thinking about that. But uh, yes, I have uh, several other interests, uh, um, which are all scientific, but um, that um, normally uh, do not belong to what science uh, today recognize. Uh, the point is that I'm not studying these things because I believe in these things. I study these things because I want to verify with science if these things exist or not. I do not care at all about prejudice, about uh, um, belief system, or they cannot exist. Of course, they don't exist. I have to see what the data are showing to us. Only when we have the data, namely numbers that we can measure, that we can put on a chart, 
uh, that from which we can derive equations, then only then we can say it exists or not. And if it exists, then we can say how it works. In the same way in which we, we can study the physics of quasars, for instance, variable stars, or some, it's exactly the same methodology. Then I have also other interests, of course, yeah. uh, which are sometimes related, yes. Well, with the UFO topic, for instance, it's one that's been rising up in trend. It's one I've talked about many a times for many people from the Galileo project. But the way that I'm starting to hear you kind of talk about it is like you're you're interested much like how I'm interested in it. Like if it's there, let's try and figure out what that is. You're trying to find a clear answer. But everyone who's got an iPhone is trying to take a video of something and say, this is it. And this is 100 percent this. It's hard because with science, you're always testing the boundaries. But at the same time, you don't want to go on a witch hunt. And a lot of times it seems like money gets thrown out for something that could be an essential witch hunt. Now, the idea of an aliens, it really depends on where your stance is. Do you believe that they came here? For me, I don't think they've contacted us i definitely think there's something more than just us out in the universes because we don't really understand the full scope of the universe i mean we understand a lot of it from scientific data and stuff but it's just endless nothingness upon endless nothingness so you're really to think that we're the only things that could possibly be alive around the whole entire galaxy solar system whatever you want to say it's just crazy but also at the same time to say that aliens are contacting people and communicating with them and giving them the winning lottery numbers, that's even crazier. So it's good to find a clear answer on this. And as much as you might know, everyone's got a different perspective and opinions on it. And I think you stand where I stand, where it's like your perspective's cool and all, but I want to see the evidence and I want to prove whatever that is. And that gets to be the hardest thing, because when we talk about this topic, there's a lot of people who have made this their identities, who have made this their belief system. And that's what the sketchy line kind of gets drawn. If you show data or you're wanting to see data or evidence or some type of anomaly, or you say it's some type of star or solar flare or whatever you say it is, they're going to get a little bit upset. So we need to try and find clear pathways to be able to show a conclusive answer. I, I cannot hear is. you anymore. Can you it's hear me? frozen. You oh, good? that's okay. Yeah. 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 So you're trying to find conclusive evidence on what this is. Yes, I would like, uh, we uh, all would like, it's good that uh, uh, there is a um, very big group uh, that uh, uh, joined together to try to unite uh, all the competencies, uh, scientific competencies and effort to try to understand. The point is that we don't have, I don't personally, but I think also my colleagues don't have in mind uh, the idea of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence it could be, this is only one of the possibilities. I have to tell you, because we have to be, uh, how to say, honest um, with, uh, with ourselves, uh, with, with, with people, that uh, there are some phenomena that uh, might look like uh, structured, uh, might look like artificial, but can be explained uh, as natural phenomena. For instance, I'm studying some, um, strange phenomena that have been happening uh, uh, many years ago in 1959 uh, in Russia, uh, um, in the so-called Dyatlov Pass, where um, some explorer died uh, during a, an accident. And there is a colleague of mine who is, whose name is, is a computer scientist, but he is also a mountaineer. Uh, he uh, wrote a very interesting book about the Dyatlov Pass incident, and he discovered that, that these people have faced uh, um, something uh, very scary, which was probably caused by a sort of ball lightning. Okay, so uh, the behavior that has been described, not only by them, but also by other people in the area, um, uh, such as beams of light, uh, uh, which everyone would say, oh, this is a, a la laser super weapon of the aliens. This kind of events can be explained as a natural phenomenon, something like a beam of light, which could be emitted by um, stro um, strongly rotating uh, and high, um, a high temperature ball lightning. When it rotates, it can flatten it can become like a flame saucer practically and release energy from the poles, from the polar 
regions in the form of beings. Uh, and this is physics, this is normal, it's something that happens also in the pulsars on the, on the bigger scale of the universe. This, I tell you this only to tell you that we have to be prepared that uh, what we see when we have uh, strong data in our hands, we could deal with a natural phenomenon, not necessarily with alien spacecraft, but we have to be prepared to everything. We have to be extremely cold, agnostic, and uh, uh, never following any belief system. N not the interest, uh, you know. It's interesting to, to, to see if there is other alien intelligence coming to visit us. And science doesn't exclude at all this possibility, OK? But it, we have to be cold. At the same time, we have to be uh, called also in the opposite way because there is a hyper skeptical behavior by some which is um, which is not scientific because they block completely any possible scientific exploration and innovation and it's itself a belief system so we have to be extremely cold to stay in the middle and to look only what the data are showing to us. Why do you think that the mythology or the fantasy like idea of aliens or some type of weird explanation that seems like it takes it goes down three rabbit holes and it takes a bus loop or something like that to get to the answer of what this could possibly be. The most idiotic thing that I've ever explained to someone or said to someone of my opinion of what it is, is that it's ball lightning or some type of weather phenomena. Weather phenomena is at the bottom of the list when it comes to the ideas of what it could be. A lot of people in the community, alien, UFO, Twitter, whatever they call it, they like that mystery. They like that fantasy. And my kind of explanation and understanding of that is because they have a problem with science and they like this. They like this because you can't, you don't really know what it is either. So they think that since it's unexplainable by you guys right now, as of now, they think that, oh my God, this is, it's got to be aliens. And it's like, well, it can be explained through sitting down and listening to an idea of what it could possibly be, but they don't want that. They, they look at it like, no, I want the more fantasy route that someone took four solar systems to get to our planet, especially because of our human race. It's like, well, is it possible? Like for me, I always talk about climate change, for instance. Could it be some type of reaction from uh, like a mirage is? Could it be something like that? Could it be some type of weather phenomena? People, what happens is if I show you a shadowy figure and I say, what do you think this is? It's kind of like the Rorschach test. You start being able to decide, oh, it's this or it's that. Imagine mirages. You have a bunch of people wanting to believe that it's some type of alien thing. And next thing you know, they're just really staring at some type of weather phenomena that's going on. Yes, no, the problem, uh, this is sociological uh, issue, which is not my, my field, but uh, uh, I see that uh, there are many, many persons who are not comfortable with the scientific method. Um, in reality, I think that in a society, materialistic society like this one, people as, um, how to say, in a subconscious need uh, to believe in something uh, supernal, something superior. This is human. I understand that, but uh, there is a tendency to, this society is very materialistic, and so people need to uh, evade uh, in something uh, uh, like a possible alien intervention and also in a very masochistic way sometimes because it, it seems they enjoy very much uh, telling the story of so-called abductions uh, which uh, in my opinion look ridiculous uh, if really aliens are making that kind of abductions with uh, butcher knives uh, well, that is not a very advanced civilization. That looks like something like the Middle Age, okay? So the, the phenomena that are described are so ridiculous and so um, you know, out of any logic that uh, it seems that we have to consider some other kind of phenomena which occur inside our mind. So hallucinogenic, um, effects we don't know yet everything about what our mind can create in particular situation even out of any drugs okay 
So um, I think much is, is occurring inside our mind. Honestly, uh, I, at least some aspect of the phenomenon. Hmm. What would you say, I guess, when you're doing research, you're trying to kind of sort through anomalies, what are the common things that you can give advice to people out there who are looking at the sky to be able to kind of like, because I mean, everyone's got phone videos, and I feel like the public's coming in more of contact with phone videos of alien ships or UFOs. And that's the ones that get the TV publicity, not the scientific stuff. I'm just curious from a scientist perspective and someone who researches this and kind of looks deeper into this, what can you give the public to be able to decipher if it's a real video or if it's something that's just completely not nonsense well the um the first thing uh, they should do uh, would be uh, if a person takes a video about a strange allegedly a strange phenomenon in the sky they should show it uh, uh, to scientists and, uh, and they uh, are the first ones uh, atmospheric scientists or physical scientists in general they can tell them um what can it be? For instance, if you if you video also with a smartphone um, or take a photograph um, uh, of the sky it being very close to a very luminous source like a street light, okay, or near the sun, uh, you can see some strange things that are um, lens flare. That those lens flares look like real UFOs, but are optical effects inside the camera. <clears throat> and then uh, <coughs> there is the phenomenon of ball lightning, which is rare, but not too much rare. I was uh, lucky uh, to, to see uh, one of them at least three times in my life. They can happen. And uh, sometimes it's uh, hallucination because I, when you sit uh, too long in a uh, fixed position and you suddenly stand up, uh, your brain received, uh, uh, develops uh, uh, those phosphates in the eye that uh, make it appear it is a UFO, but it's not a UFO. It's a physiological effect. Uh, in general, I would say when a person thinks to have uh, taken a video of something strange, they should show uh, to us. And sometimes neither us are able to, to say what, what it is, but the, before reaching any conclusion. And then uh, uh, regarding people looking at the so-called UFO videos, uh, many of which are posted on YouTube, I would advise people to be very, but very careful because most of uh, them are hoaxes and especially today, using CGI technology, it's possible to build up uh, uh, every kind of fake. And so people must be extremely uh, careful. Um, I would advise not to look at these videos because most of, practically all of them are fakes. And they, are, uh, they create a bad psychological effect because um, some kind of some of these phenomena, even those that are hoaxes, uh, create a psychological effect in the mind, uh, which practically it frees the mind of pe people. It uh, it blocks the critical thinking. It is very dangerous. It's uh, something like the effect of uh, religion, okay, over people. People start to have faith in that. Their mind stops working. So it's very very dangerous. And one of the reason why. Um, scientists uh, uh, decided to join together to try to understand more about that is that it, it, it's good that we try, we make this attempt, because if we don't do that, someone else will use these strange lights, both making hoaxes and using these lights to create new sects, new religions, which are extremely dangerous for the conduction of our society and for the freedom of free thinking of people, rational thinking. This is the most important. So I would say be careful when you look at these videos, absolutely, and uh, look at them coldly. When it comes to something that you can't explain, like 
have you ever came across any evidence or someone showing you something or something that you just haven't been able to narrow down with science, like something that just kind of boggles your mind a little bit of the answer? Yes. Well, it happened. I, uh, in the past, uh, uh, I have been uh, um, doing research uh, um, in several places of the world uh, using some portable measurement instruments, in particular uh, in Norway, in Estalien, uh, which is the place which I studied more. And uh, yes, uh, we got uh, um, several photos, videos, and measurement, uh, electromagnetic measurement of these things. We didn't explain what they are, but we uh, are able to quantify uh, quantitatively uh, their behavior. We know how they behave. Now we systematized all the phenomenology. Uh, but uh, um, I have been thinking about that like a natural phenomenon, a strange natural phenomenon, I would say, that sometimes shows geometric shapes. In this case, I, I, I have no way to, uh, to explain this. I only think, for instance, to the snowflakes. Snowflakes, when you look at snowflakes um, on a microscope, uh, you will see that they are perfectly symmetrical, geometrical. So nature produ produce geometry. And so it's possible also, but we don't know yet, that plasmas in particular conditions, namely ions and electrons, can produce geometrical shapes, um, maybe uh, shaped by the Earth's magnetic field. In the past, uh, so I have been um, experiencing this um, while doing research. But I also experienced other things that uh, I cannot explain at all. And uh, I have no explanation. In this case, uh, for instance, I was sitting uh, um, on the side of the car, smoking a cigarette uh, and looking uh, at the sky, thinking of nothing. I was completely normal. There was a party inside, so I went outside. All of a sudden, my uh, sight was attracted by a point in the sky, and just there, there was a, a star-like uh, light that was moving uh, randomly, you know, erratically, and, uh, like if it, it wanted to attract my attention. Something like telepathy, let's say crudely, uh, it was something like that. It happened several times. Uh, um, and I have never explained this. So there must be something that also interact with our mind. There are some phenomena that we call paranormal, but probably they are absolutely normal. It's something we don't know yet. We have to study more in depth, okay? Because here there is a structural problem, okay, and that comes from, from, from the past, from the time of uh, Cartesius, Cartesius was telling that uh, uh, matter and consciousness are to two totally separate things, res extensa, the matter, and, and res cogitans, the thought. I don't think the things are so. It's possible that consciousness and uh, mind and matter sometimes can interact together and create uh, something okay so this is a shadowy side of the universe that uh, of of things that do happen because there is a very rich statistics also from uh, physical scientists and we have the duty uh, to uh, to investigate also this aspect which involves our consciousness so we have to try to make experiments in a control laboratory because I feel that this is extremely uh, important. Um, uh, yes, so well, I, I don't yeah. hop. I don't hop in the boat of uh, ball lightning phenomena, but I do hop in the boat when it comes to weather. Um, mostly, have you ever seen like gas, like just gasoline? If you leave the cap off a gas can or something like that, you get to see like gas fumes coming out. Like it's it's clear. But you see like a warped kind of vision in a sense, like it seems like you're looking through like a like a kaleidoscope, not really like 
as drastic as a kaleidoscope, but just the, if I'm looking at you right now and you're looking at me, it looks like there's like a bend, like it, like it seems like your vision's warped a little bit. I look at like, is there an ozone impact? Cause the same thing you just explained about looking up at the night sky and seeing a little light like that. I've seen the same thing and this light move, like it, it was trying to grab my attention. I've wondered what that is. And I start realizing there might be some type of environmental thing. Cause how many people really stare at the middle, like in the middle of the night, stare up at the sky without looking through a telescope. They just stare. You can do that, but a lot of people don't take the time to do so. And I think your eyes start to adjust. And I think with like the environment, for instance, I have no idea if you're seeing some type of some type of environmental impact from pollution or something like that, that's causing your eyes to warp. I mean, light pollution is a real thing. So you got to look at the concept of maybe there's another type of form out there that our eyes are just have to adjust to or have to learn or because we've caused something i i hop in that boat but it's so hard because it isn't explainable in a sense or we don't have that information yet and it's kind of hard when you're smoking a cigarette and looking up at the sky to pull out a measuring kit or do whatever you have to do to be able to research that so you don't have an answer for it but it's very very strange to me how it uh, immediately gets lumped in with aliens where I'm like, we don't understand our earth to a full capacity. And we don't, we understand even less about our minds. Why are you like, it's um like, there's a, a, a type of a syndrome or something like that. When you stare at clouds, you see everyone see something different that can happen with the sky as well, too. You have so many lights going up there. Everyone can see the moon. Everyone can see these things that we all agree upon, but also depending on like, is it an imagination thing? Like, I feel like maybe technology has taken away a bit of that creativity when it comes to just free thought, like imaginary figures or whatever you want to call it. Everyone had one as a kid, but when you look at like, is that maybe everyone's creative aspects going out of control because they are really on their phones all day? I have no clue. Maybe it's a, a factor of staring at your screen. You're staring at your screen so much, you're on social media so much, or and the common person is, maybe your eyes have to adjust. And next thing you know, when you're staring at something that doesn't have a blue light right in your eye, you're seeing some weird abnormalities, I'd say. It's possible. It's possible. We live constantly glued on a computer screen or in a smartphone screen. And um, um, all of a sudden, when we go outside in the dark, uh, some phosphine remain inside our eyes and create these flashes of light. I think it's physiological effect, but people um, mm, normally don't think about that. They tend to think to of UFOs or paranormal phenomena or something. I think there should be a better education at school um, on elementary physics, uh, uh, just to help people uh, to to diagnose uh, um, critically what happens to them from both from the point of view of their physiology and from the point of view of the external nature because knowing how things work uh, it makes people much more tranquil okay uh, much more confident in their own capability but if a person tends to fantasize for instance looking at the cloud that is a uh, flying shaped like a flying saucer, uh, uh, something uh, so-called analogic thinking start to, uh, to work, uh, and which is something that was um, uh, working in the Middle Age. It, the, it, this kind of inspiration was the same inspiration that uh, uh, um, invited the ancient people to believe, to, to believe in some gods in the sky. So this makes people not free. This is my opinion. I believe that creativity is very important uh, uh, to be merged with uh, rationality. Okay, but if we leave our mind uh, um, only to creativity, that can create monsters. It can be very dangerous and um, out of control and not only but uh, uh, people lose uh, faith and confidence in their own rational capability uh, for instance pareidolia pareidolia you see shapes that are incredibly identical to the face of an alien and then they say oh that's an alien no it's our brain it's our um, how to say all the image that we have inside from the media uh, that uh, induce us to recognize something, but it's only pareidolia. So 
people must uh, learn to recognize uh, um, what happens in the external world uh, coldly, coldly. Not only, but with marvel, because these things are marvelous. This belongs to nature. And nature is marvelous by itself without any need of UFO. So people must start to learn to love more nature as it is uh, uh, than invoking uh, alleged gods that are coming to save us or to punish us and to see pareidolia in somewhere. Uh, then only when we have uh, 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 a control of the environment in which we live uh, only then then you are in a condition to judge and see yes there is an anomaly but these people uh, cannot see an anomaly because for them everything is an anomaly yeah that's, that, that's that's the difficult part is that when we look at examples for instance the psychological impacts i'm in the, i'm 100 percent worried about that out of everything just because of a concept of people don't realize like telling someone like cursing at someone or doing that, that can be a stress reliever for you, but it has lasting impacts on somebody else. And I think, and especially if you look at the number of cases of alien cases, since everyone always points back to the same old thing, and they always say from the Manhattan Project is when we started seeing more alien cases. So when we launched our first thing that can be able to warp this Earth's surface with some type of radiation is when we started seeing impacts like this. You think that could be psychological or do you think it's an alien being worried about the fact that we've discovered nukes? And then they'll always say, well, th that's when you see most of the alien occurrences come up. And I go, also, when we look at an examination of our psychological impacts, when did the social media device come in? When did all these other avenues and all these other things that have caused us to be suppressed cause all these types of things? Memory, for instance, is the base biggest example I use against um, experiencers. When I hear an experiencer story, I go, when did this happen? They go, when I was a kid, I'm like, you understand, like you start adding stuff to that memory to make it a more better story because storytelling is how civilizations have grown. Storytelling is how people, they use that on a daily basis. A good storyteller is a good podcaster in a sense, but are you blending details to make the story fit? better and then after a while you forget what the original details are it's like eyewitness encounters for instance only a veteran or someone who's been to war and has been there for that legit 100 percent experience can be able to be used in an eyewitness testimony in my, in my opinion only because they've seen the dangers they've they've noticed to take every aspect of the environment in. when you hear an experiencer story they go, I can't really remember that, but they can remember very crucial things when it comes to making the narrative fit. That's when I start looking at this factor of like memory. It's very, very back and forth, depending on which way it goes. Sometimes you'd be like, did I really go to that basketball game? No, I've never been to a basketball game, but it's been so much time that hasn't been answered for. It's like my biggest issue with conspiracies, JFK, 9-11, any of these types of things. You let too much time go by to where people forget about it, and then they try and pick it up later the issue is becomes when it, with future generations you want to leave a legacy for those future generations to make to learn from your mistakes and be able not to step in the same potholes but we can't do that because we're erasing that record and we're not coming to grips with that record as well either people just want to let things go by let things slide past well that becomes an issue 50 years later there are scandals out there that i've showed on the show before and someone goes oh well it's a hoax how do you know? None of us were alive to experience that. But when you have 10 different stations have newspapers about this one specific event, do you think there was some relevance to it? Do you think money got slid through? And they go, well, that's a good point. It's like, yeah, that's the thing is that we don't have any conclusive evidence anymore. And I, I sadly, I think we're in the generational kind of world now where people are happy with not having the evidence and it makes it harder for a scientist like yourself to be able to want to explore that evidence. You know, I mean, um, Avi Loeb, he's on the Galileo project. He has a, a good idea of like, hey, we should be researching what else is out there. I'm in that boat as well, too. I don't, you know, uh, planetary defense, asteroid impacts that could happen. We're lucky it hasn't happened yet. I mean, it's just random stuff tossing into our atmosphere. Now, aliens coming here. Here's where we're, me and you are about to hop in the hypothetical boat. If they did come here people go, what would they want from us? And I know it's, I don't, I don't want to bring us to that, like questioning or that skepticism, but I think people really underestimate the human capability and the fact that we are fascinating. We are intelligent, but we don't have the right when it comes to like space colonization, we don't have the right to leave this planet yet. 
because we don't have all of our ducks in a row. We're still fighting over very trivial shit. And when you look at the grand scheme of the world and other universes and other planets and solar system civilizations or all this, we can't even get over the fact of like, there are people that will pull a gun out on you at a drive through at a fast food place. Like, that's an issue. That's something that I feel like humans at this point should have excelled past that. But people love that mystery. And that's where my issue with mystery comes in. Because when you live in that fantasy realm, you revert back to like a toddler. And then you never want to become an adult. And then you're 40 years old, and you're really skepticizing of like, fairies are real. It's like, oh, my God, I thought you were supposed to learn at 10 years old that there's no fairies. Am I right? Wrong? No. Oh, your mic, your mic's uh, muted. Uh, pause. Oh, yes, and no, I am. There you go. Okay. Yes, I understand uh, your um, your reasoning. I think that the people uh, tend uh, they don't want to grow practically because. Uh, it's very comfortable to believe in fairies, especially when reality is hard. Uh, living in a world like our Western world that is very competitive, uh, if a person is frustrated, uh, they need to, this is my vision, uh, to build up a fantasy world, okay? Um, but there is a point that I don't want to forget to tell you. Uh, I. Um, my interest is in the physical data of the phenomenon. But as my wife, uh, my wife Susan Demeter is a scholar uh, who studies UFOs from a psychological and sociological point of view. She taught me, um, and she's a very deep scholar, um, she taught me that uh, we cannot disregard the importance of the witness of a given phenomenon, because probably uh, there is um, a strange connection between the witness of a phenomenon and the phenomenon itself. And it has to do with a possible connection between consciousness and matter. This is something very important to study. Not, it's not my field, but it's very important to study. And I, I, I'm curious because we are going to um, install in the next uh, year, at least, probably before, uh, several um, automatic uh, instruments uh, in, in hot spots uh, of the world, starting from the United States, uh, to see if there are in the sky uh, strange light phenomenon. But uh, m personally, this is my own. It doesn't represent uh, Project Galileo, but it represents myself. I'm wondering. Is there any phenomenon happening when no one is observing? Is the phenomenon happening also when we are not present? Or is that the phenomenon is attracted by our mind? This is something that we have to have the courage to investigate. Not my field, but I hope psychologists uh, um, study better the thing because the a witness, when the witness is sincere, when the event happened to the witness are a real anomalous event, the witness is a crucial uh, element, uh, probably of the entire so-called UFO phenomenon. So we have to consider also that interaction between witness and the phenomenon itself. Does the phenomenon happen when a witness is not present? This we can see. Because if we put instruments at night when everyone is sleeping, we will see if something is passing in our sky. Otherwise, we have to admit that there is a so-called paranormal phenomenon that happens in strict interaction with our subconscious. And there is something that comes from the inside. Okay, I say this is not my field, but I accept also that component. It's just what something came to my mind. Yeah, there's a you know who David J. Halpern is. Halpern is. No, he wrote no, a I book don't. called The Intimate Alien, and his perspective is is that it's like a religious thing. He believes that people channel it from inside of themselves, like something like that, like to deal with the death of his mother from cancer. He believed that it was a demon, and the alien was a demon that he was 
channeling out of themselves, kind of like um, there's an old project called uh, Operation Stargate or Project Stargate. And it was like Men Who Stare at Goats, that movie with George Clooney, where they had a bunch of like psychological warriors that were able to use like certain tactics like cloud bursting, being able to use your mind to separate a cloud midair or something like that. Something crazy like that. Now, that is something where I, I is that kind of what you're hinting at is like an aspect of like, could there be a possibility that if that anomaly is happening only when people are looking at it, is it something that we're channeling out of ourselves? Is it something that we're projecting out into the world? And I, I mean, for instance, when you read somebody's face, you can tell if someone likes the conversation or not. You can also tell if someone is like, oh, maybe I shouldn't bring up that topic or maybe I shouldn't go this way. It's it, People call it empathy. Well, where does that empathy factor go from? Is there a capability to our brains when it comes to being able to really kind of like they say sound frequency and vibration is like all these types of things they always toss out. Is that is that a possibility? Well, there hasn't been enough evidence on it. And honestly, I'd look at those before I go. And here's where I say the mystery becomes an issue. Someone can believe in aliens. That's fine. I don't care. I'm willing to have a conversation and talk about it and, you know, join in on it. But when you see $750 billion get made to a UAP study program that is only investigating outside sources or alien UFO craft, that's when I have an issue. I'm like, what about planetary defense? What about all these other factors that are important for human civilization to go on rather than knowing if we're just alone in the universe? Like, it's interesting to know if there's other stuff out there, but there's Bill Nelson coming all out on NASA's uh, program saying we're going to look for our origins on Mars. I'm like, what are you doing? You're you're sowing seeds into people's head to believe that there's this idea that we don't come from this planet and these other things. Now, if that's true, I'm not saying don't look into it. I'm just saying for the general public to want evidence and not stay in fantasy land, you have to come straight with some data or something. And that that's a, such a vague statement that was given to the public over here in the States that it became an issue. Yeah. <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear again? you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, I understand your point. Um, but um, what do you want to know from me exactly? From them? Do you think it's a possibility that if this anomaly is only happening when we're looking at it, do you think it could be some type of thing that's we're projecting out there? Not like an environmental creative. It could be. Thing. Yeah. Well, it could be. It's a bit exotic, exotic uh, um, idea because uh, it's difficult for a physical scientist to accept this but it could happen because and i can say because it has happened to me too it has happened to people that i know this kind of uh, phenomenon and um, we so we need a sort of interdisciplinary um, way of studying these uh, these things for instance uh, um how to say, physical scientists who are uh, measuring uh, the phenomenon uh, from how it happens outside, and at the same time, uh, neurophysiologists who are measuring with EEG our brain wave. We can do some science also that and see how the peak of the brain waves or the type of the brain wave is correlated with the uh, phenomenon luminosity, phenomenon speed, uh, phenomenon color or something. I remember I was um, with a colleague in 2007 and we went uh, to uh, an important conference which, which is about the study of consciousness, uh, which is um, co a famous conference organized by Professor Stuart Emeroff, uh, who is from Arizona University, um, Quantum Mind. Okay, and we planned uh, an experiment practically that uh, uh, deals with this. You, on one side, you have uh, a witness, a person, maybe talented, uh, psychic talent, uh, with um, EEG in his uh, head. Uh, on the other side, we have uh, a set of instruments that are monitoring the sky. All of a sudden, a light phenomenon appear. At that point, we hit the light ball in the sky with a laser beam, with a laser beam, and see what happens to the phenomenon when it is hit by the laser beam. 
Why we expect this? Because this has happened. It has happened in Stalin in Norway, it has happened in other places in Argentina. This kind of phenomenon reacts to laser light. Okay, this can explain prosaically like a photon photon reaction, but sometimes it looks like a real, a really a kind of intelligence. I told you, um, aiming a laser being against the phenomenon. Meanwhile, there is a person with an EEG. My question is, what happens to the brain of the of the human test at the moment in which? Um, uh, the light phenomenon is hit by the laser beam because if something happens simultaneously in his own brain I would be tempted to think that uh, there is an entanglement uh, mechanism that relates our brain with external phenomenon. I think it's very important to make this measurement. Uh, it's uh, feasible and I think um, we don't need more than $200,000 to make this a uh, campaign of, of systematic observations at specific places where light phenomena occur very often, like in Norway, for instance, but also in some American places like a Yakima Reservation, um, Brown Mountain, um, the Marfa in Texas. Uh, 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 there are several places where um, this kind of phenomenon, like light balls, happens more often. So to see if there is a correlation between our mind and this kind of phenomena. I am very intrigued by this thing and I think it's extremely important. And I am very um, confident because we can make a rigorous measurement also on this side of the phenomenology. Are there other experiments just like that that you said that can easily be funded to be able to prove a lot of these factors as well too or be able to test capabilities that our minds can have because I feel like a lot of the funding like I mentioned 750 billion dollars or something like that it gets tossed out to like one thing in particular and it's in one area of research like uap study which is just more funding to be able to see if aliens are out there where i go is there other ones that we can budget it and be able to see if there's other experiments or things that we can run to be able to give congruent answers on these actual things that are happening right in front of us rather than taking the long shot and saying it's an alien encounter well <clears throat> at my knowledge uh, the one i spoke about uh... Uh, to you now is the only experiment that I know because I, I understand it. Uh, regarding experiment with mind, um, that's not my field with mind per se. That's not my field. I can only say this. We could do uh, another experiment which comes to my mind. Um, imagine to have with you in a group of um, scientists that are working on the field with instruments to monitor the sky. Imagine that with you, you have um, psychic talent. So a person who is able to make uh, remote viewing, uh, clairvoyance or telepathy or something like that. Well, let's, we have a human antenna. So why not using this kind of person without telling that person that we are using and see if this kind of people attracts the phenomenon and if the phenomenon is appearing we are there ready with a lot of instruments to take measurements uh, and so to make science about that this is something came now to my mind but that, that this has nothing to do with project galileo eh? I, I have to tell you that project galileo is only for not studying the witness but studying only the external phenomenon um using instruments for in in, in this phase well i'm also but, talking to you on out of the blank podcast so you don't have to worry about me correlating it to galileo research but do you think do you like being more free about able to discuss these types of ideas? I feel like with the Galileo project, there's a lot of people that are in specific to one thing. And I'm, that's why I've had like five or six of the people who are involved in that project on here. And I've talked to them and I've tried to branch out of what they always stick by like the same scripted thing. I'm like, yeah, but where does your thoughts go? Like, I feel like in a group or an exclusive type of thing, you should be free to express your thoughts depending on whatever direction they go for, even if it's not your area. Oh, in fact, I feel completely free. In fact, 
I tell to you, but uh, you know, <clears throat> it could happen that uh, some, there is a mis misunderstanding and uh, I have to uh, tell uh, sometimes when I what I say represent only myself and not the group to which I belong. I just tell that not because I am afraid or I feel not free. I'm free to tell what I want. In fact, uh, a proof of this is my website where you see I, I treat several uh, subjects also very hot, also very <clears throat> strange, okay? Because I'm a free thinker, okay? Another thing is rigorous measurements uh, and uh, on that uh, thing, uh, uh, clearly uh, I remain what I am, a rigorous astrophysicist, but I'm also a free thinker, okay? Fortunately, I think I'm not a sheep or something like that. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's important uh, uh, to think also of uh, subjects that are uh, apparently impossible, because if some of these subjects come to your, our mind, they come to our mind, <coughs> not by chance, but um, probably because something is inviting us to ask some specific questions. For instance, yesterday I was seeing a beautiful, um, a beautiful um, presentation by um, Dr. Jacques Vallée at Rice University. Uh, it was a conference, a very beautiful conference. At the end of his talk, uh, Jacques Vallée told a phrase, mentioned the phrase by an uh, um, Argentinian mathematician, which uh, impressed me very much. And I would like to, uh, to read it to you. I have it on my Facebook. Uh, this phrase is, uh, says, be prepared to have many false breakthroughs, which don't survive the glaring light of rational scrutiny the next morning. You have to dare to imagine many false beautiful theories before you hit on one that works. Be daring, dare to dream, have a faith in the power of new ideas and hard work. Get to work, dream. Gregory Chaitin, Argentinian mathematician. So this phrase was mentioned by Jacques Vallée at the very end of his talk. And uh, I'm stealing it from him, mentioning him clearly, but I want to stress the importance of this phrase, especially because it was said by a quite famous mathematician. You have, we have to dare without uh, any, without being afraid uh, to um, trigger scandals inside the corridors of our church, because sometimes uh, science behaves, yes, like a church. It's like the church of the new millennium. And, and, uh, and this is good when uh, uh, it demands uh, um, strong uh, rationality and rigor. That's perfect, okay? But it's not good when you try to, to kill creativity. If something creative is coming to our mind, there must be a reason. And we have to explore it. We have not to be afraid to tell this and to discuss with our colleagues. It could be stupid. It could be something that is nonsensical, but it could be something that has an importance. And uh, science is done not only with uh, calculations or measurements. Science is done also with ideas. And uh, I would like to mention um, uh, something, an uh, idea by physicist, uh, quantum physicist, uh, David Bohm, on uh, whom I published a book about uh, David Bohm. And he was telling that uh, uh, practically, there are two orders in, of reality. There is one explicate order, which is the order of reality, causal reality, where you have uh, causes and effects, where everything is based on space and time. And then you have an implicate order, where 
there is no space and no time okay he says that the reality is like a ship the explicate order the causal uh, reality uh, based on space and time is like the engine of the ship that allows the ship to move in the water instead the implicate water implicate order is like the radar of the ship so what does it mean it means that without a radar a, a ship can go everywhere but if you don't know where are you going you go around and round okay this if science is made only like the explicate order we can go round and round uh, without um, having a goal we have to have a goal we have to have a consciousness we have to have a radar we have to have a guy who is looking with binoculars and say you have to go there you have to be able to envision uh, the, uh, the the place where you want to go and then you activate all the machinery all the engine but you cannot use the engine if you don't know where you're going so science must must be um uh, I would say I miss uh, the, the intuitions uh, of uh, um, Newton, for instance, uh, who, by the way, was interested in alchemy and uh, the heroic moments of physics uh, of quantum, uh, when quantum mechanics was invite, invented, when uh, the general relativity was invented, because it was a uh, there was a passion okay it was not only a narcissistic not narcissistic but uh, aesthetism of doing calculation calculation of course are fundamental we don't have any science without that but those taken alone are useless it's it's a mental masturbation literally it, instead we have to be uh, what to say complete to think in a complete way okay uh, to be able to um, develop ideas and to face those ideas without being ashamed to have those ideas and then to see to, to reason on them and see what comes out well that's what i appreciate about your perspective see because a lot of people if as soon as like you know they'll they'll put in a title quote or they'll put in detail in an episode part of the galileo research project or something like that that's not what i'm going to put for you because you're a free thinker that's what i wanted to get out of it was that i don't want someone to be confined that they have to be in this specific thing when they come on and talk i'd rather hear all your ideas no matter if there's science behind it when it comes to what you think your perspective is everything it's consumed who you are as a person that is you your perspective is your identity but people identify themselves sometimes by their belief or they identified things by their institution and what their institution wants them to say that's why you see tweets that'll say my thoughts are my own i really hope that your thoughts are your own because that's the person i want to talk to your per the perspective the value of everything i think it's who is it it's um carl sagan that said your mind should be open but not open so much to where your brains fall out like that's very, very important. Like you should be open and interested in the psychological, the the paranormal stuff. I've talked to people from the skeptic society. I've talked to people from everything. And they're always confined to that one thing that they're consumed by that position for. And I'm not saying that the Galileo Research Project wasn't having you dive into other realms or anything like that. But when you're on here and you're talking, I want to hear all that stuff because that's how I understand that that's the point of science as well too. That's the stuff that people should be seeing that should stuff that people should be knowing is that they're not just congruent in their answers they're not definitive and come with high um what is it ivory tower syndrome where they're sitting on giant pedestals they're open to ideas and they're open to talking but also there's they like to have evidence as well too and i think with that idea it's like yeah we don't know anything really about our minds i mean the fact that people say oh there's no way you can bend space and time with your mind it's like yeah per that we know of now but i have no clue where our mind's going i had um john joe mcfadden on here who made neo-darwinism um he talks about quantum biology um quantum evolution i go you ever notice that whenever we dive into a topic we keep researching into it and discovering more and more about it the deeper and deeper we go i go do you ever think that would be the concept of human like extinction in a sense 
And he kind of gave me a pause. And I go, if you really think about contemplating what your life is, if your life is more than going to your job and coming home, it's your family, okay, go deeper than that. And you keep contemplating your own reality and going deeper and deeper into it. You end up having a panic attack because you realize, holy crap, the fact that I can wake up and my lungs work, my heart works and everything's functioning properly. And I don't even think about it on a daily basis or the fact about breathing, like you really start diving deep into things. I start going, that is what science is also and everything about us is really heading towards. It's discovering more and more and more. And you realize that the fact that you didn't know that this was all happening right now or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and there's more and more coming out. That's fascinating. What else is deeper beyond the layer? But you got to be careful because with you open up that door to questioning and curiosity, you're also opening up that other side that comes with it where it goes, that could lead to your own, your own demise in a sense. And I think that's fascinating. So the idea that it's 100% this and it can't be that. Well, don't toss the baby out with the bathwater. Let's keep that in there. But let's understand our priorities will be set on one thing, but the options and avenues to let something else come in if there's enough evidence that's very important yeah yeah um i agree um and uh, um, i was speaking before about the um, i don't know how it came to my mind about uh, the metaphor of a boom of the um, uh, explicate and implicate order I was telling that it's good that we um, consider reality in an integral way, considering both orders, okay, radar and engine, not only the engine, not only the rationality, but also the intuition. Uh, so we are complete um, men, okay, and we can really discover because otherwise we are blind. We don't see the direction where we are going. We are, we are not seeing the, the castle that is on the top of that hill. Instead, we have to see where is the cat castle before moving, okay? But there are some things that fascinate me or when I consider only the explicate order, namely uh, phenomena in space and time. Sometimes there are things that are extremely interesting without any need of any radar in the sense that you consider only the explicate reality, the physical reality, uh, from the data, now, theoretically, we don't we don't need any consciousness uh, to analyze mathematically the data that will come out from uh, the Galileo project, for instance, because when we analyze the data, this is the, the rational part of Massimo Tudorani. When you analyze the data, how they vary, for instance, pressure, temperature, magnetic field intensity. Uh, how they vary with time, okay, you can deduce what is the physical mechanism that is moving those objects in the sky. If you understand the mechanism, you understand the, the maybe the propulsion mechanism uh, by looking at them while they're flying, which is much better looking at them while they're flying than dismantling them inside the garage, inside an anger, okay? Because you see what they produce electromagnetically while they're flying. We measure, we, we obtain numbers, uh, rigorous numbers, mathematical numbers that we can put on a chart. And when we have the equation, then we can reproduce all of this in a laboratory. We can make the same. Potentially, we can do the same by studying what we see from the outside. So this is an example on how only rationality can bring very good results, okay? But uh, if you first don't use uh, um, a radar, you know, uh, uh, then you don't have even the idea of uh, physical variability of the phenomenon. There were mm, some colleagues of mine that never thought about the possibility to study this light phenomena uh, like we study stars. For instance, uh, when we studied quasars and we saw uh, when we discovered them that they, uh, they are object at cosmological distance, uh, they are galaxies, practically very old galaxies, which have a black hole in, in the nucleus. 
in, in the very middle, okay? And the reason of the strong variability that we saw in all wavelength is due to the fact that sometimes there is an accretion, there is always an accretion disk of disintegrated matter by the gravity of the black hole that sometimes occasionally uh, falls in, towards the nucleus and give rise to big explosion. Just to tell you that uh, this variability, in this case, violent variability, helped us to understand the physical mechanism uh, of, of a quasar. But there are also other uh, pulsars uh, or, um, you know, uh, star spots, uh, uh, pulsating stars. We know that these stars behave in that way because we studied the variability of its physical parameters. So we can apply exactly the same type of methodology to study these lights strange in the sky and uh, in order to derive a true physics. But if you don't have that malice in your mind to think in this way, you would never do that. Instead, you have to think there is a, a, an analogy. Sometimes analogies can help us to proceed forward. Okay, so we have to be able to use both the rational mind and the other mind. Otherwise, we are only robots. We are useless. This was something that came to my mind. There's a, a weird balance between being a skeptic, but also being open minded. Um, science seems to have always try and find a conclusive answer. When we say science, we just talk about like the ones that seem to be more about their egos and a lot of sense, some scientists on that concept that'll leave something because it just sounds like fantasy rather than looking into it. I like to leave all cards on the table. I think you stand in that same boat as well too. Not saying that you're going to put all your eggs in every single basket, but saying, yeah, but to deny the possibility of something that we don't really truly research or understand, that just sounds asinine in a sense. And I I think yeah. I, I, I have hope for the future. Do you have, you have a little bit of hope there? I, have, I think people will get their minds together. I think it just needs a, people always think it's going to be aliens. Like, oh, I don't think it's that. I think it's just about understanding the value of somebody's perspective. I think when you can really honestly talk instead of having fighting or all these types of concepts come through, it's just like having a group of people that agree with you. Have some people that disagree, but that doesn't mean it needs to turn into an argument. Science is in the form or it's in the direction of human capacity moving forward. And people tend to forget that because it becomes more of a me rather than a we. And that, that, that that's not just in science. That's just the world yeah. in general. It's absolutely true. Yeah, and, um, I have to remind that there are some uh, uh, scientists, uh, yes, they are scientists, sometimes they are pseudo-scientists, that are uh, so fond of their own idea uh, that they confuse reali re reality with themselves. And they try to pilot their own research only to demonstrate their own theory. At some point, they will tell lies to themselves and to the theory. We have to be very objective. We have to compare. We have to discuss with the others. We have to see if the others obtain the same result. So uh, there are some rules in science that are eternal, uh, Galilean rules. And so it's not a question of me, it's a question of all of us. Uh, it's, it's the universe. And um, only the data uh, have to speak. So people, I have opinions about something, but the, uh, it doesn't work uh, having opinions when you don't have yet the data. You cannot have opinions about um, witness stories because it's something subjective. And, and it's like to build a house on moving sands, okay? We, you have to build a house on a very solid uh, basement, okay? so. In, in some aspects, uh, in, in the most important aspects, I'm totally confident in the scientific, uh, classical scientific method. But um, fortunately, I was not born blind uh, to speak um, in a meta metaphorical sense, okay? Some are blind. Some are very brave um, mathematically. Uh, logically, but they are completely, totally blind. Their universe is a cube, 
and uh, Israel literally a cube. They are cubic people, and and they are sad. It's very sad. These people will never uh, put the world forward. They can be useful sometimes. Uh, their skills can be very useful, and they can be very useful uh, to um, how to say uh, to stop uh, uh, charlatans. Uh, uh, to stop uh, cuckoos, like we call uh, them, uh, pseudoscience. They are very useful in these things. I support them. I, I, I don't dislike skepticals, but they don't think they make the history. They don't. And when they start to speak about, uh, uh, about their own way to see science uh, like a dogma, like a religion, like a belief system, uh, then this pissed me off literally because I'm a scientist, okay, <laughs> and I cannot accept it. Science is innovation, exploration, first of all, not uh, making a mess inside the church, okay? Yeah. Um, you're going to have to give me uh, another, uh, some more time next time um, to be able to talk because I got another topic I want to talk to you about. Um, that I'll save for the next episode uh, if you want to come back on. But please let everybody out there listening know where they can find you, your website, your Twitter, um, and anything you want to leave on to let the people know, maybe a curious yes, scientist. I would like I would like to uh, sign on my, my website. My, uh, my website is easy to find. It's MassimoTeodorani.com. Um, simply www.massimoteodorani.com um, and if someone is interested in uh, electronic music uh, I'm also an electronic musician play synthesizers and sequencers and uh, uh, there inside my web website there is a link to Bandcamp um, my pseudonym music is Totem Tag and uh, if someone is likes uh, tangerine dream like music uh, well that's me my attempt it's my second life i would say uh, my right brain sometimes also left brain because you know synths need uh, a lot of rationality to use them so massimotodrani.com and there you can find um, i see almost everything well, i'll link everything in the description massimo it was a pleasure talking to you Thank you very much, Robbie. Uh, I, it was uh, very nice to be here. Thank you to have me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.